So with this lecture, I'm going to give you an introduction to some of the best practices for starting to uh, draw the figure. With a little bit of history, let's take a look at historical ways of approaching the fig figure. So throughout the ages, you know, artists have been fascinated by the challenge of depicting accurate proportions of the human body. There have been countless attempts to standardize figure uh, drawing proportions and laying down proportional rules to follow when depicting the body. However, you know, observing how many systems of measuring proportions exist, or canons as they're called, should be our first indication of how open to interpretation proportions are, and that perhaps no single proportional system, you know, can be consistently accurate or necessarily trusted, I suppose. So what exactly are proportions? This is something that we've discussed over the course of this class. Um, but as a reminder, proportions are the relationships, ratios between the heights, widths, and depths of a subject. So in order to draw a believable likeness of any subject, no matter what or who it is, um, we must draw you know, the pro proportional relationships as they appear to that specific subject or subjects. So, you know, every canon or system of measuring proportions is a search for a certain ideal of beauty. However, as the idea of beauty is so subjective, fluid, and ever-changing, so have the canons been throughout history. So, for example, the celebrated Greek canon created by Polycletus, you know, defined a strong male athlete who excelled at gymnastics and in the handling of weapons. So a typical example of this canon is Dorophorus, which is one of the best known sculptures of the classical era. However, you know, just as today there are few bodies that fit into current ideas of the ideal body, it is likely that few bodies in Polyclitus's day fit into the quote ideal body of Dorophorus as well. So in the Greek canon by Polyclitus, the palm of the hand was chosen as the unit of measurement. So a goal of canons is also to establish a unit of measurement to divide the body into more manageable, measurable sections that would establish these ideal proportions. For example, in the oldest known text on proportion, which was an Egyptian canon, the length of the middle finger was chosen as the unit of measurement, and it was thought to be equal to 1 19th of the total height of the body. So during the Old Kingdom, standard, standing figures were represented you know, 18 modules tall, from the soles of the feet to the hairline on the forehead. The navel was located at the 11th module, heads were represented in profile with a front-facing eye, the torso was pictured facing forward, and the lower body from waist down was also shown in profile. And figures were represented with, you know, two left or two right feet. Uh, Marcus Vitruvius was a 1st century BCE Roman architect and writer, and he believed that the height of the figure was 8 heads or 10 faces. And as we know, Leonardo da Vinci demonstrated many of Vitruvius's ideas on proportion in the well-known image of the man in two superimposed positions inscribed in a square and in circle. And so this is titled The Vitruvian Man. But as you may have guessed, the search for a perfect measuring system is rather pointless. Uh, there's so much variation in bodies among individuals that it's impossible for everyone to fit into any set of standards. The unique qualities of each individual are part of the challenge and also the complexity of and fascination of depicting the figure. So what we're going to focus on is how we can, you know, draw the figure and really make it specific to that individual rather than to some sort of overarching ideal that, that doesn't really fit in with anyone. So you can estimate proportions and then check them with a fair degree of accuracy by employing what is called the plum, the thumb, and uh, pencil method of finding proportions. So you hold your arm out straight without bending the elbow, and bending the elbow will bring the measurement closer to your eye and increase the size. The measurement will be consistent if your elbow is always locked every time you measure different parts of what you're drawing. So you tilt your head uh, to bring the eyes as close as possible to the pivot point at your shoulder. This is important to keep the measurement consistent throughout the whole subject. Close one eye, use the tip of the pencil as the top point of whatever you're measuring, and put your thumb at the bottom point. So now that you have the unit, you can compare it to another part of the figure. For example, it's very common to count you know, how many heads uh, length, length of the heads will fit in the height of the pose. So move your measurement down below the chin and note where the thumb is. 
So here we have the back of the head. You know, you have the thumb at the bottom of the, the, the neck there. And you measure that down, you see this person, you know, in that pose is actually, you know, eight heads compared to their own head, right? So I'm using the term pencil for simplicity's sake, but all of the following applies as well to a pen, a crayon, charcoal, whatever your drawing tool is. So these are three sighting strategies that I use very often that are very helpful. So finding the midpoint, using plumb and level, and also taking comparative measurements. So these immensely useful and versatile procedures yield immediate and effective results. You'll learn to measure proportions as you see them rather than as they actually are. Um, of course, we know that objects appear the way they do because of their underlying form, but we are going to draw what we see rather than what we know. Um, and it, it is a fact that the average human figure is about seven heads high, but when your model is slouched in a chair, legs pointed towards you, that information is really of little help. So using the sighting methods of midpoint, plumb, and level, and unit of measure will help to move to be um, a more direct means of obtaining accuracy in your drawing. So first off, finding the midpoint. So think of your subject as a shape which you divide at the midpoint. So that half above the midpoint fit must fit into the top 50% of your drawing area and the half below must fit into the lower 50%. So studiously finding and using the midpoint in this way measures that each half of whatever you divide will be in proportion to the other. So it's also important to draw, you know, develop your drawing as a whole. So doing this sort of midpoint measurement helps to ensure also that your subject is going to be on the space of the paper and that you're seeing as a whole and also developing your composition in this way. So using plumb and level. So use your pencil uh, like a carpenter's tool. Um, you can establish the vertical and horizontal alignments of your subject and transfer them one at a time to your paper. So this strategy is especially useful in establishing the action of your subject. And also using comparative measurement. This is something that I find very useful, particularly when I'm drawing you know, multiple objects on a page or a still life or even multiple figures. And it's also a, it's a strategy where you measure with your pencil the length of one part of your subject and compare it to the length of another part. So this procedure is basic to finding pro pro proper proportions. Um, so taking frequent comparative measurements is a good way to check on proportions during the course of your drawing. Use your pencil as a measuring tool to compare the length of one part of your subject to the length of another part as you, you know, have an idea of their relative sizes. So foreshortening is something we're going to take a look at with our drawings. So this is a technique for producing the illusion of an object's extension into space by contracting its form. So foreshortening produces an illusion of the objects projecting forward into space. Foreshortening deals with overlapping. So beginning with the form nearest the viewer, shapes are compiled from large to small, one overlapping the next in a succession of steps. So you can also take a look at this bicycle, for instance. We know that that, that center bar of the bicycle um, is quite long, but when we look at it you know, coming out towards us in space, it's shortened and at a strange angle. So sometimes what I do to help me is to take my pencil or my drawing tool and actually like hold it up in space along that line at that angle and then I can kind of see it more carefully or more objectively and that will help me to draw it properly on my paper and compare that I'm drawing it at the right angle and the right length. So you can see also that like you, you can compare like the, the horizontal measurement, the, the tip of the end of the bicycle seat over to where that pull of the bicycle ends. And that can force us to get things correctly by really objectively stepping back and just comparing a, a thing, the measurements of where one part of an element ends and another begins, for instance. So foreshortening does not apply to the figure exclusively. Any form that you see head-on can be foreshortened. So in foreshortening, spatial relationships are compressed rather than extended. And with foreshortening, proportions, scales, and sizes will be contrary to what you know about the actual proportions, shapes, and sizes of the objects that you're drawing. But only if you draw the untrue proportions, you will perceive what the drawing will look like and, and draw it actually true to life. 
So George Rohner's, you know, 20th century version above of Andrea Mantegna's 15th century Christ Below represents an example of extreme foreshortening. So the forms are compiled one behind the other from foot to head. The head, the leg on the left is more severely foreshortened than the, the one on the right, which is represented in a side view. So the leg on the left is compressed and each anatomical segment maintaining its own discrete shape. There's no flowing from one form into the other as we see in the other leg. So really when you're dealing with this, dealing with this kind of extreme foreshortening, it's a series of overlapping shapes, one on, stacked on top of the other. So sighting is really helpful with foreshortening. Try to draw what you see and not what you know. Foreshortening is closely linked with perspective, although it usually comes to play when drawing the figure or animals, you know, when we must rely on the eye rather than constructive perspective. So when you're drawing a more complex shape, the effect of foreshortening can be very difficult to achieve convincingly. You can end up with what looks like a very misshapen object. Practice, it's not easy. So here you see, you know, the arm of this woman foreshortened going back, you know, in space. So we know that the arm obviously is a certain length, probably a similar length to this other part of the arm here. But we, in order to depict it properly as she is posing there, we have to see it instead as a series of overlapping ovals, perhaps, and, and move them one on top of the other back in space to you know, the imagining where the wrist would be, you know, thinking about like if I held, if I drew a circle or had, um, or if she had a bracelet around her wrist, that might give a, help, a helpful definition to creating those um, concentric ovals, you know, coming stacked on top of each other. So a great way to deal with something like a still life, for instance, or even anything that you're drawing is to establish a unit, establish your own unit of measurement. So oftentimes if I'm doing a still life, I might decide on something that um, I can easily, you know, get down in space individually. So here you have the milk carton. You can take a look at the height and compare it to its width. You know, the height of the milk carton is double the, the length of its width. And that can help you get that one object down in space. And then what you can do from there is to draw lines from that object that you have down in space over to others and see how they compare with one another. How does the, the width of the orange compare to the width of the milk carton, for instance? And so on and so on. So plumb lines. A plumb line is an exact vertical line that you cannot that you can draw to see alignments within the pose. So if drawing uh, from a model, you can actually use a string with a weight at the end to determine the, the perfect vertical. And then when you see that, you can compare, you know, um, how much of the figure is on one side of this vertical and how much of the figure on the other. Where does the knee bend out or the, or the elbow bend out? We can also use horizontal uh, alignments. So um, horizontal and vertical measurements are more accurate than angles. They're much easier to get right because you can align them, uh, you know, with the edge of the paper. And we tend to have pl a pretty clear vision in our mind of a horizontal and a vertical. Um, the other thing that's really helpful are negative shapes. So I think that's something that students often, you know, tend to forget about. Take a look at that space in between elements. So a negative shape is the space around or between the object. Uh, or the subject. So it's the background with no detail at all. Negative space is employed as a brain fooling method to see shapes with clarity. So the empty spaces between elements that you're drawing can be easier to judge than the shapes of the subjects themselves because we have less preconceived notions or opinions about what the shape should look like. So we are more likely to have an unbiased evaluation of the negative shapes. So when citing, you must begin by establishing which object or shape will serve as your point of reference or unit of measure. And when working with the human figure, the head is the frequently used as the point of reference. So we're going to also take a look at portraiture and drawing heads. So this diagram provides a rough guide to proportions of the human face. So the eyes are located about halfway between the top of the cranium. So don't include the hair and to the bottom of the chin. And then measuring from the top of the forehead at the hairline before the skull starts to recede, horizontal divisions in thirds fall at the eyebrows 
and the top of the ears, um, the bottom of the nose and ears, and the lowermost portion of the chin. So the center of the closed mouth is one third the distance from the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin. So you can see in this diagram, this shows you, you know, the sort of half division and also these sectional third divisions. So the standard proportions for the human head can help you to place facial features and find their orientation. But at the same time that I show you this, I also want to remind you that each individual person that you're drawing is unique. And each one, um, you know, to make them look, make it look like that individual person, you have to really pay attention to the exact measurements of that person that you are particularly drawing. However, you know, something like these general proportions does give you a good idea of how to create these measurements and what to be looking for. So here's a, a standard, um, a list of standard facial proportions that can give you a good idea of these ideal proportions. So the eyes are, you know, about halfway between the top of the head, not including the hair and the chin. And the mouth is about halfway between the nose and the chin. And the corners of the mouth may line up with the center of the eyes. Uh, the top of the ears generally line up above the eyes on the eyebrows. And the bottom of the ears often line up with the bottom of the nose. So keep in mind that these quote ideal measurements vary from face to face. Um, so it's important that you take you know, much more specific measurements of a particular person's face if you want it to truly look like them. So really observe, make sure that you're observing those details. So here I threw in a few examples of some portraits that my students did in the past. They had some fun with color. And then part of what I introduced to them was um, a method of creating a basic stencil called a pouchoir. And we looked at, you know, the possibility of like adding a headdress or a tattoo to have some fun and playful qualities to the space. So um, hopefully when you get to doing your own heads and drawing your own figures, you'll have a lot of fun with playing around with how you can best also express the personality of that person.